ready to start the next lecture, which is an area, government docs. I just, I need to know so much more about it. it since none of them will just say, Kim, here's all your stuff. No, they're going to make me research. So we're bringing to you two people from the library staff, Brittany Stiles. Um, and I'm just going to read the, the bio, even though you probably already read it. She is a state publications librarian, has worked for the State Arizona Research Library for two years. She maintains a collection of publications produced by the Arizona government agencies from territorial days to present. She has worked in a lot in the libraries for nine years and she received her master's of library and information science from the University of Arizona. And she says she's very excited to, to share the state's publication. Well, we knew that because she agreed to come and speak with us. Uh, her partner in crime, I'm going to say, Janelle Brev, Brev oh, I can't even talk today, Brevveld, and I'm sorry, Janelle, if I misspelled that. She is the federal documents librarian for the, the state of Arizona Research Library. And she also serves as the regional coordinator for the federal repository or depository library program. She also supports the library's Patent and Trademark Resource Center. And again, Janelle enjoys speaking on federal documents topics. And as we all know, it includes genealogy, legislative history, and the census. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Brittany. Uh, Brittany, are you speaking first? Is yes. That how yes. Okay. I will let Brent, the team of Brittany and Janelle um, guide us through that government docs. And again, put your questions in the Q&A, or if it's a general question that you just want crowdsourced, put it in the chat. Thanks so much. It's all yours. Okay, awesome. All right, guys, for this presentation, I'm going to um, turn off my camera and, uh, and then share my screen. So let me share my screen first. Give me one second, guys. Um, all right, share screen and then slideshow. All right, can everyone see my slideshow? Yes, Brittany. Okay, awesome. All right, so here I go. I'm gonna turn off my screen. Okay, all right, let's get started. So as introduced, I am Brittany Stiles, um, of the State Publications Librarian, and today we're going to share an overview of State of Arizona Research Library government documents. Okay. Okay. So uh, for those who don't know, the State of Arizona Research Library and Archives are part of the Arizona Secretary of State's office and were based at the Polly Rosenbaum Archives and History Building in Phoenix. Can everyone see the Polly Rosenbaum um, slide? I just want to make sure it's working well. Yes, Brittany. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, so... The, uh, the research library consists of closed stacks that hold historical and current, um, and current books, maps, newspapers, periodicals, microfilm, and more. Our library's mission is to collect, preserve, and provide access to information for all Arizonans about their government, their state, and their world in a variety of formats. Um, as, you, as you probably already know, our library holds unique collections that are invaluable for research, and this includes the Arizona collection, the newspaper collection, uh, federal documents, our maps collections, state publications collection, and our law collection, which contains Arizona's current and historical annotated codes, official statutes, regulations, bills, as well as session laws. And the library has a patent and trademark resource center. To learn more about all of our collections, um, feel free to visit the library's website. All righty. Now I'm gonna shift gears to specifically focus on resources available for the state publications. You will hear more about the federal documents from my colleague Janelle later. Right. To start with, has anyone done research using government publications? Um, I think right now a poll will be displayed on your screen so you can input your answer.
Okay. Okay, awesome. All right. All right, sweet. Okay, so yay, I get to sh uh, share more about this. All right, give me one second. Oop, hold on. Sorry, previous. Okay, so, all right, so let's move on. So, all right, so we're going to talk a little bit about the history of the collection um, and how it'll be useful to you guys. All right, so the Arizona State Government publications are documents published by Arizona State Government agencies from territorial days to the present. The collection was established as its own in 1980. And the State Library is the central repository for all official publications per Arizona Revised Statute. So this means state agencies are required by law to send copies of published documents to the library for preservation. While the collection had, while the physical collection has been, can be accessed through our library catalog, there are over 39,000 digitized state publications on the Arizona Memory Project. All right. And when doing research in this collection, it is best to understand that all state publications are organized using the AZ Docs classification system. The alphanumeric system is modeled after the Federal Superintendent of Documents, or known as SUDOCS classification, which my colleague Janelle will go over in her section. Um, this means this all means that government material is grouped and organized by the issuing agency rather than by subject. So this type of method for organizing material is different from well-known call number systems, such as the Dewey Decimal System. I added a picture of the anatomy of the AZ dot call number and a screenshot from our library catalog for a visual effect, just so you can understand everything I'm saying. Um, hopefully this is helpful for you when you are conducting research through this collection. If you have more questions or want to learn more about the classification system, a link has been provided in the chat to the AZ Docs classification guide. The guide provides information about all the state agencies that have ever existed in, in, in the Arizona government, and it includes all of their sub agencies. Um, but you can always reach out to me as well for more guidance on how to go about searching for items in this collection. Okay. All right. So here is a list of what state publication uh, state publication collections mostly consist of, and the and these doc and these items that you see, those are the ones I'm usually usually pro processing um, and adding them to the collection. They come more often. Um, than other documents. And at, it, we, as you can see, there, we have quite a, a diverse amount of publication types created by state agencies. And that list is not all of what the collection has. Here are more types of materials that, that are published by the state agencies. And I kind of wanted to give a quick, quick example. Um, recently, I did a, a presentation for an elementary school, for elementary school teachers and discovered that the state um, publications collection has coloring books for kids who wanted to learn more about the history of the state of Arizona. And I didn't know that. And just doing my own research through the collection, I found those and I found other unique things um, that I thought was really cool that was published by the state agencies. Okay, so now I'm going to discuss some of these types of materials and gems that may be useful to your genealogy research. All right. I found that directories and rosters provide an array of information about persons in various occupations. Um, we have quite a few directories from universities, the Arizona State Bar, the Arizona National Guard. Other directories are the State Medical Directory and the Arizona Criminal Justice Commission Directory, which are on display in the slide. The medical directory published by the Arizona Board of Medical Examiners provides names of doctors who are currently licensed for the year, a roster of deceased doctors, and those who have inactive status. For this particular title, we have the years 1935 to 2001 in the State Library collection. And while what we have for the Criminal Justice Commission is more, uh, more recent information, I still think it is vital to genealogy because um, the Justice Commission directory lists the names of judges, police chiefs, and prosecutors across Arizona for, for every year. 
The collections bulletins are similar to directories in the types of uh, information that they may provide about individuals. For example, the um, Arizona Real Estate Estate Bulletin um, published by the Arizona Department of Real Estate recognizes realtors and brokers across the state, uh, across the state um, in their in their issues. Um, also, the bulletin names individuals in the real estate field that required disciplinary action from the commissioner of the Arizona Department of Real Estate. I thought that was just an, an interesting thing that is done. Not only do they talk about, um, they, they recognize the people that work in real estate, but they also notify or, no, or you know, make known those who are not, not doing so well in their career. Um, so I thought that was very interesting. Um, the next one is, um, as we know, uh, we have quite a few newsletters and um, published by the state agencies. And they're not just published by the agencies, but they're state boards. We have newsletters by schools and universities, prisons and health and healthcare facilities. Um, on the slab is an Arizona Department of Transportation publication that has been mentioned in a previous presentation by Brandy Hellowa. I wanted to highlight it again because I thought it was just really vital to genealogy. Um, as she said, the, the publication is a monthly vehicle accidents and fatalities report. The report lists fatalities by county, circumstances, and provides names of those involved in the accidents. And I thought this was just a, still, an, as I read through it, I still thought it was just a really interesting and um, useful resource in regards to genealogy, especially if you want to know more about how someone died and their death and the circumstances around it. Um, the next one um, is a prison report. Um, I'm highlighting this monthly report I found while assisting a, a patron. It is the report of the management of, and affairs of the Arizona State Prison, and it is published by the state, the Arizona State Prison. This um, pl a publication was intriguing to me because it provides information about individuals that have been incarcerated. For example, names, ages, uh, the county of the prison that they're at, um, it has um, the dates of inmates received and the dates of uh, inmates um, released for each month. And they, it also sometimes, as I was going through the, the collection of this type for this title, it also um, lists sometimes the type of crime committed um, uh, for each um, inmate. And I think this is just be a great resource if you're researching someone who may have a criminal background. Lastly, the, uh, the periodicals in the collection contain magazines, student publications and items published again by schools, prisons and sub and sub agencies of the various agencies. I found this unique periodical from the, as you can see in the gut in the slide, um, this unique periodical from a call the Young Citizen. And it, it's, it, it's, it names the staff at the school as well as students who helped print the newsletter or newsletter or part of the, the print, they call it the printing club. And the newsletter also mentions um, students and teachers by name for their achievements. So I found something that it mentions like a couple of students on the basketball team and how well they're doing and how and how they are in compared to other schools. So I, it was really interesting how it gave that background um, for this. Um, so oops, sorry, I'm so sorry. That is all I had to share for um, state documents. And from here, um, in regards to genealogy research, I hope this was helpful. If you have questions at the end, please feel free to ask me. Um, this was really exciting to do um, and learn. This was a learning journey for me as well. So I'm now gonna turn it over to Janelle and I'm, let me mute myself, Janelle. Wait, let me stop sharing. There we go. And then I'm going to mute myself. It's all yours, girl. Thank you so much, Brittany. And thank you, Kim, for the lovely introduction for us at the beginning. All right, so hopefully everyone can see the federal document slide on my screen. And uh, real quick, before I highlight some of the specific gems that are in the federal documents collection, I wanted to start just by providing some general background about the history of federal documents. It's a really unique area that I don't think everyone is familiar with, so I thought that would be a helpful starting point. And uh, just like Brittany, I'm also going ahead and, and turn off my video just so I'm not a distraction during the presentation. 
Okay, so typically genealogists are looking for information about people, and the United States government is one of the largest publishers in the world, and it's been collecting and maintaining documents about its people for two centuries. So um, this is going to be a really great resource for genealogy research. Now, many of those federal documents are published and made available by the United States Government Publishing Office, which is also known as GPO. And throughout my presentation, I apologize in advance. Uh, the federal government likes acronyms quite a bit, so you're going to hear a few that I reference. Uh, GPO was created by Congress in 1860 to print and distribute federal documents. Now today, GPO publishes and distributes products and services for the legislative, executive, and judicial branches of government. And those products are distributed through something called the Federal Depository Library Program. So the Federal Depository Library Program, or FDLP, there's another acronym, was formally established by Congress through the Printing Reform Act of 1895. And this act made US government publications available to the public at no cost through designated depository library locations throughout the country. Now in 1895, there were 420 depository libraries throughout the US. Later in 1962, the Depository Library Act was passed and this helped to expand the number of libraries that were included in the FDLP. Today, there are nearly 1,150 depository libraries in the United States and its territories. And the State of Arizona Research Library is one of them. We're actually the regional depository library for Arizona. And we have millions of federal materials that date back to the 1800s. There are three main types of federal publications that it's helpful to be aware of executive branch materials, legislative branch materials, and judicial branch materials. And you can see those are further broken down into subcategories here on the slide. Now, as Brittany referenced earlier, uh, federal documents are organized according to a special classification system called the Superintendent of Documents, or SUDOC. Uh, and just like those state documents, federal publications are grouped by the issuing agency. So this classification is definitely different from the Dewey Decimal System or Library of Congress, which you may be familiar with. Uh, instead of being grouped by subject, as you can see in the example on the left, they are grouped by the issuing agency. So you see there under A, it's the Department of Agriculture, D is the Department of Defense, ED is education department and so on. And on the right, I've included a, a further breakdown or anatomy of a call number, just like Brittany did, that shows you um, what a call number could potentially look like. So it's broken down by that issuing agency, sub agency, series title, document title, and then potentially year or volume. So I'm going to be completely transparent. Uh, federal documents can definitely be challenging to search. They date back to the 1700s, so there are many of them. Uh, the collections can be difficult to search for subject matter experts uh, who aren't familiar with the SUDOC system and find it hard to use. Uh, there are many historical materials that haven't been digitized and made available online yet. Uh, and some of the older print indexes can be difficult to navigate. So I say all that, um, but at the same time, federal documents can be an incredibly rich source of information, especially for genealogy research. They might require a bit more of your time and effort or guidance from library staff like me to use, but I definitely think they are worth that extra elbow grease and energy to explore because you may find things in federal publications that you aren't necessarily going to find anywhere else in your research. So I wanna highlight that federal publications can be particularly useful uh, if your ancestor maybe meets any of these criteria. So if your ancestor was involved in the military, dealt with government, was a government official, settled in a frontier area, suffered in a disaster, was an immigrant, attended a government institution, was a Native American, was a member of a minority or oppressed group, 
or was involved in banking, transportation, or commerce. So it's also possible if your ancestor doesn't meet any of this criteria, they could still be referenced in federal publications, uh, but these are particularly clear categories uh, that we do like to highlight because I think it's helpful to be aware of. Okay, so the most significant federal publication for genealogy research is called the United States Congressional Serial Set. And we're gonna go ahead and take another one of those fun polls. So you should see a pop-up box on your screen. And we wanna know, have you ever heard of the US Congressional Serial Set before? So we'll give you a few seconds to respond to this. And I'm very curious to see what the answer is. And just a few more seconds here. Okay, so this is as I expected, 78% have not heard of the US Congressional Serial Set. And um, I will say I'm not surprised, but I am thrilled that I can introduce this wonderful resource to you today. So I'm glad you're here, you're with us, and you're gonna learn about the Serial Set. So for 78% of you who weren't familiar with it, the serial set contains federal publications that are bound by each session of Congress, and it dates to 1817, so it is the oldest, longest-running federal publication. With more than 15,000 volumes, that's right, more than 15,000, it documents the work of Congress and more broadly the history of the United States. And in the serial set, you may find military records, immigration records, land records, lists of government employees, pension records, and so much more. So for the first 14 Congresses, congressional publications were just individual documents with no numbering plan. And these are known as the American State Papers, and they are the predecessor to the serial set. And you can see here on the screen, uh, the American State Papers have been partially digitized by the Library of Congress's American Memory Project, and they are available on their website. So after the burning of the US Capitol in 1814, Congress was really concerned about preserving permanent access to government information. By 1817, starting with the first session of the 15th Congress, they established the serial set, and the intent was that it would be the official publication documenting the activities of the federal government and it has run consecutively ever since. So what might you find in the serial set? Well, content has varied, but since 1979, the serial set typically has included Senate documents, reports, treaty documents, and executive reports, as well as House documents and reports. Now, some of that other content that has varied over time, here are a few examples. Uh, in the past, sometimes the serial set has included presidential messages and documents to Congress, the House and Senate journals, congressional directory, and sometimes congressional hearings uh, for very significant historical events. Now, this wouldn't be a presentation about genealogy gems if I didn't highlight a few gems in the serial set. These are some of my favorites. Uh, so you can find the official records of the Union and Confederate navies in the War of the Rebellion. There's the patent registration from Abraham Lincoln, who's the only US president to hold a patent. There are the reports from the House Committee on Un-American Activities and the Iran-Contra investigation, and some of those special hearings that I mentioned. Uh, there's one for the assassination of President Lincoln, the sinking of the Titanic, and women's suffrage. So how can you access the serial set? Well, our library does carry quite a few volumes in print. Um, however, many of them are historical. Uh, they're definitely difficult to search in print form. So I recommend two different options where you can access the serial set online. The first is a database called Hein Online, which our library has a subscription to. 
And Hein Online, if you're not familiar with it, this is a wonderful resource that has a large collection of digitized government documents, including the serial set. Uh, but I do want to flag, this is only available to use um, on our computers in our library's reading room on site. So if you wanted to search Hein Online for any genealogy research, you would just need to contact us to make an appointment. So Hein Online has digitized 96% of the serial set. So that's 96% of those 15,000 plus volumes, which is incredible. And their website has some really helpful advanced search features that you can use. So it's pretty easy to search by an ancestor's name. You could also search by a keyword or a specific volume or document number if you actually had that information. And I just pulled two different examples I wanted to highlight that I thought were interesting. Uh, so the first, I searched for Pearl Hart, who was a female uh, outlaw here in Arizona in the 1800s. And I put her name uh, in quotation marks just so it would search for her entire name as a whole. That's definitely a tip for Hein Online. Um, and I got six results back in the serial set. Uh, one of those results you see on the right hand side, this is um, a letter that was included, uh, I think in a house report at the time um, that references that she was imprisoned and then later released on parole. So I just thought that was a, an interesting find. Now, another example I found uh, was for a gentleman named Frank Luke Jr. He was a member of the American Legion here in Phoenix in the 1930s. And again, I found five results specifically for his name. You can see some of the screenshots here on the slide. Uh, two uh, are related to his work with the American Legion, but my favorite is on the bottom right. Uh, I guess Frank Luke Jr. participated in a sharpshooter competition in 1937 with the American Legion, and it shows that he ranked 15th. So uh, these are just two examples of, you know, really unique pieces of information you could find in the serial set uh, if you're looking for genealogy information. So while Hein Online is a fantastic tool, I recognize you may want to be able to search the serial set from the comfort of your own home. And there is an option to do that. Uh, it's a website called govinfo.gov that is managed by the United States Government Publishing Office. So all information on this website um, is official and has been approved by the United States government. And GPO staff recently started a wonderful project where they are digitizing the entire serial set and making it available online for free. So as of right now, they've digitized volumes from the 15th to the 42nd Congress, the 69th Congress and the 82nd Congress. So they don't have the same uh, level of information that you can find on Hein Online, but there's still quite a bit here. And you can search GovInfo uh, again by name, by keyword. You can also browse by topic and you can search by serial set volume or document number. I do want to flag, um, I have found that the name search uh, when you're researching an ancestor, sometimes the results can be hit or miss again, since it's not as comprehensive as Hein Online. Um, so just keep that in mind if you're using this for research. There may be more information that you aren't seeing. Um, but while it may not be as comprehensive, it's still a wonderful free resource that you can use at home. And I know GPO staff is working diligently to add more volumes to this site. So you'll see more information get added over the next few years. So in summary, why is the serial set important? It matters because it contains a primary source material that covers a wide range of topics, and it can be particularly helpful for finding really unique information for genealogical and biographical research. So if you want to use federal documents for your research, I think this series is a really great place to start. Now, the next significant federal resource that I'm sure you are all familiar with is the United States Decennial Census of Population. Now, the Population Census takes place every decade, 
and it's mandated in the Constitution. And it first took place in 1790 with six questions. So it has an increased in length over time. Um, while the Constitution only requires a population count, the census has expanded over time to gather other forms of information. So here is one brief example of some of the different types of information the census has gathered over the years. On the left-hand side in 1840, you see that it tracked pensioners for revolutionary or military service, while on the right side in 1880, it tracked school attendance. All right, so even though the census has varied over time as far as questions it asks, uh, in general, from 1850 to 1950, you're likely going to find a lot of these details in census records. So name, age at a certain point in time, state or country of birth, parents' birthplaces, year of immigration if relevant, street address, marriage status and years of marriage if relevant, occupation and value of home or personal belongings. So due to the 72 year restriction on uh, access to census records, census records are currently available only from 1790 to 1950. And it's incredibly exciting. Uh, this is really great timing for us that the 1950 census records were just released yesterday on April 1st. So there are currently a few different resources for finding census records online. As I mentioned, uh, the 1950 census website just launched yesterday. This uh, information was released widely to the public for the first time on its own website. And you can see that link here, 1950census.archives.gov. I'm guessing many of you may have already gone into the site and started doing some research uh, because it's really exciting for all of us. Um, but if you haven't seen it yet, on this new website, you're gonna find census images, population schedules, and enumeration district maps and descriptions. And you can search these records by state, county and city, name, reservation, and enumeration district. So um, we had fun yesterday uh, starting to search around the 1950 census. And one of my colleagues located this really great record that I wanted to show you today. So um, in the image on the slide, I know it's small, but highlighted there, uh, there is an entry for Edwin Rosenbaum. And it tells us that she was born in Iowa. She was a widow. And at the time, she was a grammar school teacher. So if the name Edwin doesn't sound familiar to you, it's because she was better known to all of us in Arizona as Polly Rosenbaum. She was our longest running state legislator and she is also the namesake for our state archives and history building. So this was a really fun find for our staff yesterday. So 1940 census records are also available on their own website for free. And you can search and download images from the site to save or share with others. And the National Archives and Records Administration has also compiled a list of resources for 1790 to 1930 census records on their website. As some of those, as you can see here um, in the screenshot that's on the right, those are available for free on websites like familysearch.com, if you, or excuse me, familysearch.org, if you create an account. I just wanna highlight two other census examples. Uh, this one is another great gem. Uh, it's from the 1870 census and it was in Prescott, Arizona. And this one is an entry for Maggie Taylor who was born in California and her occupation was listed as fancy woman, uh, which is very interesting uh, for those of us who've looked at a lot of different census entries, this one jumps out. So I just wanted to highlight this for the group. And here's another one. This is from the 1880 census. This is from the East Coast in Massachusetts. It's an entry for Andrew Davis, who was 70 when the census was taken. He was a ship carpenter who was born in Massachusetts, as were both of his parents. Uh, so just in general, uh, census records can be a wonderful resource from the federal government to use for genealogy research. 
They can help you reconstruct your family tree through information like names, relationships, birth years, marital status, birthplaces, and parents' birthplaces. Next, you can find quite a bit of useful information in military publications from the federal government. So these publications may cover major events in US military history, as well as specific branches of the military. So I'm gonna go ahead and focus because there are so many publications on ones uh, that are specifically available online, but I do wanna highlight that our library also has these and many more in print as well. So this first example is from a publication called Combat Connected Naval Casualties World War II by States from 1946. And the screenshot is from the Arizona section uh, these are the Arizona war casualties during World War II. Uh, so it lists the names of the deceased, their military rank, as well as their parents' names and their address. Now there are many military publications that have been digitized and made available online. Again, this is just a, a small sampling to give you an idea of, of what might be out there. Um, here on the screen, there's an army list and directory from 1919 to 1923. There's an official National Guard register from 1936. And then at the bottom there, commanding generals and chiefs of staff, portraits and biographical sketches. This screenshot is taken from that official National Guard register for 1936 that I just referenced. And this um, includes the listing from the Arizona page. So it lists uh, individuals from Arizona uh, who were part of the National Guard, and you can also see um, their record of service on the right-hand side. And here are even more military publications, general officers of the Army and Air National Guard. There's also the sergeant majors of the Army. So you can see this covers uh, so many different types of materials. There's a, a really lengthy time period that's covered. Some of those earlier publications I mentioned were from the 30s. Some of these more recent ones are from the 90s and going into 2000s. Um, I have not included as many links to publications about significant wars uh, solely because some of those haven't been digitized. But again, we may carry something in print in our library. Um, so again, I'm really just trying to show you the small sample of the types of publications the federal government has produced. So if your ancestor served in the military, this could be an extremely useful area of research for you, um, though it could be particularly helpful if you know the specific war uh, or the branch of the military that they served in. Even more types of federal publications. So there are other federal publications you can use for genealogy research, including annual reports, directories, and registers. And once again, I've just included a few examples for each type of publication from some different federal agencies. So annual reports, these typically cover an agency or office's activities during the year. So one example I've included here is the annual report of the Attorney General for the United States. And that annual report usually includes listings of attorneys and their assistants throughout the country. Uh, the next publication, this is a fun one, the annual report of the United States Life Saving Service. If you aren't familiar with it, the Life Saving Service is the government agency that actually preceded the Coast Guard. And so there are publications that track the list of keepers who worked at life-saving locations, as well as other service members. There are also directories for almost every government agency, and these usually contain names, titles, and contact information for staff and agency partners. Uh, some of the examples on the screen are from the Department of Commerce and the Department of Education. And finally, there are registers for government agencies. So in the example here on the screen, this is from the Biographic Register of the Department of State from 1949. 
And um, I pulled an individual who was actually born in Tucson, Arizona. It shows he was born in 1982. Uh, his name was Stephen Aguirre, and he was a State Department officer. And you can see there's a pretty lengthy bio here. This has his birthplace, education, his employment history, and his marital status. So if you potentially have an ancestor who may have worked for the Department of State, you could find a lot of information from one of these registers. Now, before I wrap up today, I just wanna highlight two online catalogs that you can use to find and access some of these federal publications. The first one is called the Catalog of US Government Publications or the CGP. Uh, this is managed by the United States Government Publishing Office. So if you're looking for a specific federal publication, you can search the catalog landing page, which you see here on the screen. And I recommend searching um, by title or keyword. So once you perform a search, you'll uh, get a list of federal publications in the catalog like this. And it will include the list of titles, year of publication, the author, which is usually a government agency, the SUDOC number, and then on the far right, there will be a link if the item is available online. So in this case, I was most interested in that first publication, Against All Odds, U.S. Sailors in the War of 1812. And so I saw that unfortunately there wasn't a link for internet access, but I clicked on the title. And I received this additional record that just has more information. Um, so if you were trying to decide if you wanted to look at something in the CGP, you can click on the title to expand it um, and just get more details about the subject, uh, when it was published, um, anything else that may be helpful for you in determining if you want to use this for research. So if you find a title in the CGP that doesn't have a link uh, to an online location, you can always check the State of Arizona Research Library catalog to see if we might carry a copy. And uh, the link for the catalog is included there on the slide. And there's a screenshot of the landing page just so you can see what it looks like. And while again, I focus most of my presentation today on electronic materials, we do carry in our collection an extensive number of materials in print. Uh, so please um, don't forget that when you're looking for materials. So I recommend if you're performing a search on the homepage that you search by title, author, or keyword. And if you're trying to search our catalog and you're just not finding what you're looking for or you're running into difficulties, please don't hesitate to reach out to library staff. That's what we're here for. Uh, in this specific instance, I was looking for that against all odds title. And lo and behold, I discovered we do have it in the library catalog. So here's that record. And you can see at the very bottom, um, it shows that we had one copy available in our holdings. So we do carry that in print. Now as a next step, let's say you wanted to look at that book in person, you could contact our library using this ask a question web form that's linked on our library's website. And the link is also included there on the slide. So what you would need to do is complete this form with your contact information. You'd include your question. And in this case, you would specifically want to tell us the title of the book. Now, once you submit this form, our library staff are monitoring it and we do try to respond within one business day. So for this specific request, uh, we would follow up with you to try to make an appointment to see this book in our reading room. Though you can also use this ask a question form for any research requests you have, if you need help with your genealogy research, or again, if you need help navigating our catalog, this is the best place to go to submit your question. And our library staff will determine who is best positioned to work with you and follow up. But we all love getting questions. We're in the information profession. That's what we're here for. So we are always happy to help. Now, I think that concludes our presentation today on genealogy gems and government documents. And I hope Brittany and I have shown that government documents, both at the state and federal level, can be a really valuable resource for your genealogy research. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And I think we're going to move to our Q&A portion. Kim, are there any questions for us? Yes. 
I will send all mine in an email. <laughs> My mind was just going like crazy. I know that. it is a lot of information. So if anything isn't clear, or if you remember later, what did she say about the serial set? Please, again, feel free to use that ask the question form and we can help. Well, I've got them. So I'm going to send you guys in that, but I'll use another name so you won't block me and say, oh, that weird <laughs> person. Um, so let's start with the questions. One was, uh, is there, it in your handouts, it does not address mining records. Are any available about mines, mining companies, employees, et cetera, that were in as part of Arizona? I don't know if that would be on Arizona memory page or Arizona historical site, or if you guys have any of this information of Mines uh, had to be licensed, I know that, but. Yeah, that's a great question. I'll start and then Brittany, feel free to jump in from the state perspective. Um, so I can say at the federal level, um, there was a Bureau of Mines. Um, so there are some publications that fall in that category. Uh, they are gonna cover nationally. Um, so there may be references to Arizona, but they may not get as specific as a researcher is looking for. So someone could certainly contact us to ask about mining information, and I'd be happy to check our federal collection. But it's possible um, that there may be more information uh, within our state docs collection or in our Arizona collection. Yes, so we do have um items in the state docs collection on mines. I can't off the top of my head, um, cause we, they're, they're kind of all over the place in regards to, cause we do have a department right now. I was looking at our, sorry, I was going to um, our, we have a mining advisory council that actually started in 2010, but also um, through, oddly enough, through uh, our University of Arizona, there's a department of mining and genealogically, genealogical, sorry, engineering. <laughs> and so <laughs> I can't talk, but we do have, quite a few the when I was doing my research on mining we do have things but they're kind of it's I don't know if there's anything about those who worked in the mines but we do have like a list of the mines and um, I, I found documents on mines but I just say contact us specifically with your answers and then I can look because I was going to say also Arizona Collections has quite a few items on mining as well so they're kind of like scat it's like kind of scattered subject matters in regards to mining in regards to state docs and Arizona Collection but again content uh, like I would like email me and then I can see what I can find for you. And then, um, and if I can't find it, I'm gonna look into our mining um, or, or what we have in the AZ collection. I hope that answered their question. But I have seen quite a few just, it's, just, it's like all over the place, like mining for this, mining for that and stuff like that. But then also we have various departments that have sub agencies in regards to mining. It's kind of all over the place, sorry. Let me ask a follow-up question to that. Cause I did tour several mines that were here pre-statehood uh -huh. and they found that they're for information about ownerships and for some of the people that I'm imagining higher up employees they had to go to New Mexico archives do you guys share information between the two since at one time this territory was part of New Mexico on that's the a, mining thing that's a good question if it's in, and if it's involving um archival stuff we would have to contact or get in contact with our staff members that work in our archives but I do not know off the top of my head but that's a very good question and the mine that I'm thinking of very in, in particular is the Vulcan mine there outside of Wickenburg yeah and yeah so yeah so um yeah in regards yeah that's a good question I we in regards to answering the news Mexico one I do not know if we are I, I'm pretty sure our archive staff could answer that better than I could okay. in regards if they communicate in between the two um New Mexico and Arizona archival stuff okay um bottom line everyone send your questions mm -hmm. to the staff <laughs> um we had another question about if you're looking for immigrant records uh, where in the federal records would you look? I'm guessing because they didn't give much more information, it's someone that uh, immigrated through a city here in Arizona versus one of the ports. Is that a question? I mean, it's kind of vague. Sure. Um, so I'll give a hopefully not too vague of an answer. 
Um, they were probably asking since I referred to immigrant records in the serial set, and typically what that may refer to um, is it may refer to just a specific individual uh, coming through a location if they were tracked in um, in a letter or if they were referenced in a congressional meeting. So usually you would just want to search that individual's name to see if there is an immigration reference to them in the serial set. As far as just general immigration records go, those are typically held by, um, again, the National Archives or other archives locations. So um, the if you're just looking for the actual immigration record for an individual, you would likely want to check the National Archives um, immigration record section on their website. And the naturalization uh, process would be the same in Arizona that uh, whatever the laws are of that time, like you can put your intent in at any court and then go like the next county over five years or seven years later and get sworn in, that would still apply. Would that be a federal record once they swear their allegiance to the country? Uh, I would assume so. I can't answer that specifically okay. since I don't know if I know enough about, that might be a better question for our law librarian to help with. <laughs> or go to Google and pull down a great book on this subject. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. The Arizona State Library was unable to help me. However, maybe your guest speakers have suggestions. What she's looking for is her paternal relatives from Greaterville in Tucson area in the late 1800s and early 1900s that were laborers on ranches and mines. She's looking for vital records on them. And she says the Arizona Health Department doesn't have records on several family members. Um, is that like hit and miss if Arizona State Library doesn't have it? Go to the county and if they don't have it, I don't know. Yeah, it, when it comes to, I, in my experience with helping people, like it's hit or miss. Um, the county might be a, a great place. Uh, the county where they live in might be a great place to contact in regards to vital records, but I, I don't know if this person contacted the archives department. Um, but she doesn't mention, she's just questioning okay. if she should, you know, waste your guys' time by reaching out to you. So I'm going to say maybe she should put her question in, ask a librarian, yeah. you guys could maybe yeah. send her. That's not so a waste said, of our time. Yep, exactly. <laughs> it's never a waste of our time. No. Um, we're always happy to look into things more in detail. And hopefully if we can't answer it, then we can figure out uh, the best place to direct someone. And Kim, Kim, if I can add something, absent yes. uh, vital records from the civil side, uh, look at church records, like baptismal oh, yeah. records. Yeah. You know, that's what I usually do as a substitute. And this is going to be our next next speaker for those that don't yes. know the famous yeah. Thomas. <laughs> He's guy with the crazy the green hair, yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> and then, um, then the same guy that asked about mining uh, records, business records and license can be researched. I'm thinking that's again on the state level. Yes. And if they want, I just, um, I looked it up. Um, I actually had this question a couple of days ago. The Arizona Corporation Commission, I, well, especially for business licenses, um, they might be, and I can put a link to their website. They have an actual um, um, thing where you can look up businesses and then they'll give you all the information about the businesses directly on the department's website. It's really user friendly. I've actually looked up businesses and through there, um, but we wouldn't keep all, especially if it's current business licenses, mm -hmm. we wouldn't, I, I'm not sure if we have the, the most current things in our um, collection, but I've been gearing people with those type of questions if they're looking for a business name or more information on a business to go to the Arizona Corporation Commission's website, because they have um, particular business names and more information about the business, and that may include licenses. So I could put a link to that department's website okay. in chat, if that's helpful. Yeah. Because okay. we're going to send them a copy of the chat. Oh, Kim, yeah. Kim here. Kim here in Illinois. Uh, the Illinois State Genealogical Society is working on a database of professional licenses, like medical, dental, a dog catcher. I mean, we have this database, and so we're working on it. So there are other licenses too. So, um, which I'm going to have a follow-up question to to what I just asked. For corporations, 
shareholder reports aren't required to be submitted at the state or federal level, are they? So far as I know, no. And I, in, in my experience in the two years, I have not seen those type of documents come my way. I didn't think so. But yeah. All right. We've got one about the census taken uh, in the Philippines. And the person asking said she thought they were done in 1903, 1940, and possibly one other year. Now, I do know Ancestry has one of those on there. They have all the territories. Um, but again, would that be a question that she should maybe send to information, ask a librarian for the exact years for that? Sure, if she, if it's not clear to her, I always initially start by directing people to um, the listing of all the different censuses on the National Archives website that's included in the presentation. But if she can't find it clearly there, then yes, certainly feel free to contact us and we can help find that information for you. Okay. Uh, the next question is, I wanted to research someone who served in the Spanish American War, but lived in Arizona. Do you have any Arizona resources? Like, was there any troops called up from Arizona? You know, besides saying, well, look in newspapers or something? That's a great question. Um, yeah. It's certainly something, again, um, that we can always, I can always check in the serial set to see if there might just be references to information there. It's possible we may have military publications, um, but I don't know how specific they get to the individual states. Um, we also have our Arizona collection, so potentially if there are any publications there about our participation in the Spanish-American War, so I think the short answer is, again, yes, it's a possibility. And please send us that request and we can see what we can find. I know that's kind of the refrain, but <laughs> well, usually that's how it works. You guys have such in-depth collection, you know, and these yeah. short answers, you know, requires. Um, if you're appointed a U.S. Marshal of Arizona during the territory days, is there a collection or a place you can go to get maybe a bio or some information on it? And since it's a U.S. Marshal, that would be at the federal level, I'm thinking. Yes, um, we do have a um, biographical database that's been put together about significant individuals in Arizona. Um, it's possible we could always check that database to see if there's an entry for that person. Um, there could be something in a federal publication, or again, there might be something in our Arizona collection. Okay, next question. And I hope you guys aren't scared to buy this one. When will the archives open to the public where they don't have to make an appointment? I guess you should expect the masses are coming. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. I think for the foreseeable future, um, we'll continue with our, our appointment basis. But if anything does change, we will certainly let the public know. But I don't think we can give any type of time frame at the moment. All right. So basically, stay tuned. Mm -hmm. uh, did the 1950 Census Indian Reservation Schedule collect the age. I'm not seeing an age box. Is there a place where they can go to get the form that the federal government used for the Indian reservations? I know that there are uh, forms posted on the 1950 website. I admit since it was just launched yesterday, I haven't looked at it in depth enough to answer that question, um, but I would be happy to help. Okay. So again, send a quick note to ask a librarian, uh, would there be information about mining accidents? There, um, there are reports about mining accidents here in Arizona. Um, so I don't know how comprehensive the listings of reports are. I know there are some in um, federal materials and there may also be some, Brittany, I don't know if there are some in state or if they're in the Arizona collection. So they do exist, but I don't know how comprehensive our collection is. So we'd really just have to check a date and location. Okay. The next question, my ancestor managed the Red Crown gas station on Grand Avenue about 1928, 1930. Would there be a license issued for this endeavor? Also, if if there was a motor court, I guess like a hotel in a small store and it was located on 27th, 27th Avenue in McDowell, 
Indian school roads on grants. So basically, is there a license for local businesses in the Phoenix area? Is that a question that they should send to Brittany? Yes, because then I can look more into the type of license. And um, again, I'll probably um, look and see if we have like um, under which the department, because I have to always look at which department may have report, uh, created or published the license. And if I don't, then I'll have to look at the Corporation Commission's website as well. Okay. So there's there's no harm in, um, I'll just find out more information though, like about the name of the, you know, who owned the gas station, like so much more <laughs> I'll have to look into, but yes. So the short answer is, maybe and write to them. Uh, yeah. Does the state keep records on nursing homes that were running in the early 1900s? I believe we do and it'll probably be under and I can check, but um, I do, I have come across quite a few documents on the nursing homes and it'll probably be under either the Department of Health Services uh, or um, yeah, Health Services would probably be the department I'll have to look under and they would just have to give me the names of the nursing homes. And, and I can look that under. Would that also encompass uh, people coming to the state for all the tu tuberculosis? Yeah, we do have document. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if we keep the list of um, the people who come in with tuberculosis. Like we have their names, yeah. but I do know we have documents and like reports on those people who have tuberculosis in Arizona. Okay. Um, question. What occupation data, databases in Illinois are you referring to, Thomas? Thomas, we will ask. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. I was oh, just hopping, right. hopping back on. Yeah, uh, there were basically databases that the Secretary of State had that were not online. They're putting them into Excel, uh, Illinois is, and there are different licenses, like medical licenses, uh, dental, you know, any professional license. They're building a database. I don't know what the status is, but I know that Illinois State Genealogical Society is doing that. So, so another good another good source too is Google Books. Remember that a lot of these associations had yearbooks, you know, yeah. for licensing. Yeah. So, um, then let me scroll down. Does the census information included those taken by the U? Uh, I believe we already answered that. Uh, I'm sorry, I must be skipping around my thing. Marshalls, uh, we talked about mining accidents. We talked about nursing homes. We talked about, okay. And, and in an obituary dated 1955, it states the person was an Arizona registered poet. Any suggestions where I can look for an Arizona registered poet? Ooh, that's interesting. I know um, we have the Arizona Commission of the Arts. And um, while I never had to deal a lot within their records, just like their annual reports, I think um, if they contact me, I can see if that department has any records on poets, um, actors, or anything that are local to Arizona. But that's an interesting question. That's new to me. But yeah, I know we just have the Arizona Commission of Arts and they might have more under them. And this person can always, um, I can put a link to the um, that the the Commission of the Arts in the, the chat too as well if they want to get going. But feel free to contact me about that one. Okay. And I'm looking here. Just oh, I accidentally closed it. I'm sorry. People are just keep asking questions. <laughs> um, let's see. To find a corporation um, and business info on Maricopa County recorder in there, can you find, okay, can you find a corporation and business from the Maricopa recorder in their document search? Or is this something at the state level? I mean, are you talking about the Maricopa County recorder's office? I guess so. I think um, they do. I know if they, they have a docket, they call it the docket area where you can do searches. Um, but I know in, in the filters, they have quite a few. Um, I've never had to, I guess I can go there right now. So they want to know more information about the a business and in yeah. looking through uh, the Maricopa County recorders. Yeah, evidently the business that they're interested in or corporation must have been based in Maricopa County. Sure, yeah. So, I mean... Hold on, I'm going actually to their website as we speak. 
Um, you can start to record it documents. I know they have all type of document types, but it all depends on what exactly they're wanting to know about the business. Cause I know you can like look for, um, I guess you can look for bankruptcy disclaimer types. They can try and put the, the business name. I do know in their dockets, they have from 1947 to the present, you can, find, you can put in a business name and look up there in the American County, County recorder's mm -hmm. office. Okay. So that answers the question. Sorry. If not, Again, use that wonderful link. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but yeah. And, I, and you guys are so nice about it. All right. <laughs> we have another one. Do, do you have records of the old soldier's home in Prescott? I'm thinking that might be a federal record. I'm not sure. Um, the old soldier's home could potentially be under, um, there's a Arizona Department of Veterans. Oh, okay. So I don't know if, um, if anything, if they had to be registered, it might be under that. Okay. And then the last question, uh, so we can take a break before Thomas is, are there any records of homes for unwed mothers in Arizona? Oh, that's a good question. Um, that would be something I would have to uh, look into. I know maybe um, unwed mothers might be something under the Department of Economic Security um, might have documents on that. I I would have to, um, if they knew some names, um, but yeah, that's something they would have to put into living answers. But that's a good question. I, I'm pretty sure we might have something and it would be under, I'm assuming, the Department of Economic Security. Okay, so uh, the day is... I really, okay. Do you have pictures of the tu tuberculosis hospitals? That might be an archival question. I know they're the ones who carry most of our picture collections. Okay. They, again, that's a live. <laughs> in other words, you're going to have to send in a note and it doesn't, yeah. <laughs> let me paraphrase because we've had several people post on the chat. You do not have to, physically be in Arizona to use this resource. Um, send your questions to the Arizona State Library, just like any other librarian. They will direct you. They will say this is what's what. If it's um, if you need to come on site to look at it, they will tell you. Uh, you can always hire a researcher to do if it has to be on site and it's not online. But don't uh, limit yourself just because you happen to be sitting in Alaska or Wisconsin or whatever. Um, I've never run into a crabby person that works at that Arizona State Library and Archives yet. <laughs> and uh, so they are very kind in that. So again, use them, use that link. Uh, don't tell them your whole family history, just like any other library, you know, just Give them the question with some facts. Um, and I think that's it. 